Welcome back, everybody, to the Miami Marlins franchise here on MLB The Show 23. We are now halfway through season number two, and the team is currently 42 and 40. We're over 500. Things seem to be going pretty well. A lot of the young guys are taking nice leaps forward. And today we're going to get up to the All-Star break as we host the Padres, and then we've got a West Coast trip against the Giants and the Dodgers. Also, in today's episode, we've got our MLB Draft Preview. Of course, the draft lies right when All-Star Weekend is, and the draft itself will be in the next episode. So we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into that later in the video. But first, we're going to focus on the current big league team. We've been playing good baseball over the last two months. Luis Arise, Brian De La Cruz, Nick Fortes, Jesus Sanchez, all these young guys have really taken leaps forward from last year. Rowdy Telez has been playing solid. Jazz Chisholm is playing solid. We do have some guys towards the back end of the lineup struggling, however. And then as for the pitching, Sandy Alcantara is pitching a lot better after his slow start. Edward Cabrera has obviously been fantastic this season. Jesus Luzardo has been a lot better than he was a year ago. Trevor Rogers is back from his shoulder. Terry missed around two months. And, of course, we just recently called up Yuri Perez in the last episode as well. He made his debut against the Texas Rangers, a game that he ended up winning over Jacob DeGrom. So at 42-40, and 40, we're currently in second place in the National League East, and we have the number three wild card in the NL with a lot of teams fighting for that final spot. If we are still in contention for a wild card spot, we're going to make some moves to make this team better. In the last episode, we talked about guys on the trade block, such as Brian Reynolds and Ellie De La Cruz, who could be interesting acquisitions for our team. As we take a look at our last three series before the All-Star break, we're playing against some really good teams. The Dodgers have the best record in all of baseball, and the other two teams we play against, the Padres and Giants, are the two teams who are ahead of us in the wild card standing. So I think this next week and a half is going to be a real test for us against three of the better teams in the National League, and we're really going to get a good idea of how we stack up with these playoff teams. We only took one of three against the Padres, but we did have a complete game shutout. In the last game from Yuri Perez, he went the entire way, did not allow a single run. A great performance from him, only allowing six base runners. His ERA through three starts is under two. So that'll bring us to this three-game set in San Francisco against the Giants. I want to get a look at Trevor Rogers, mainly because he's been injured for most of the year. And unfortunately, we ended up losing the first game of the series 5-1. to one. So our Marlins are now exactly at 500, 43 and 43, bringing us into the second game of a three-game series here at Oracle Park, home of the San Francisco Giants, who are one of the two teams ahead of us in the wild card standings. This is a team who we're going to be competing with for a playoff spot this year. So it'll be interesting to see how we can stack up against these guys, especially on the road and especially after losing the first game. The Giants were one of the worst teams in baseball last year, so this is quite the switch from them. Here's a look at both lineups. Ellie De La Cruz playing short, batting ninth. Lucas Giolito starting for San Francisco. We talked about him last year as a potential trade deadline acquisition. He was ultimately traded to the Diamondbacks and signed with San Francisco in the offseason. We'll start things off with Luis Arise, who sends a missile into right field. That's one way to kick off the game. A solo home run for Luis Arise. It's eighth of the year. That ties a career high in homers for Arise, whose power has really taken a step up this year, while his contact has been just as good, if not better, than a year ago. A big start here for Arise and the Marlins with the solo homer. Trevor Rogers on the bump for Miami. The lefty making his eighth start of the year. Missed some time with a shoulder tear, but he's back. He's pitched in one game so far since his injury. He was okay in that start. He did not get the win, however. Hoping to get one here as he starts off with a quick strikeout against the outfielder Austin Slater. Thyro Estrada, the second baseman, will also strike out. Estrada has really developed well here in San Francisco as one of this team's focal points going forward. Into the second now, same score. Giolito facing off against Jesus Sanchez. He will get him to strike out on the fastball. Nice pitch there from Giolito. Jorge Soler up next. He's been playing quite well over the last month or so. With him being on the last year of his deal, maybe he is a guy who gets shipped out during the trade deadline, or maybe Miami keeps him for a run as he draws a walk. That'll bring up Jordan Groshans, recently called up, grounds it to short, and Ellie De La Cruz misplays it. De La Cruz is not a natural shortstop. His primary position is third base, but the Giants already have Muratake Murakami there. 
Luis Arise is up here. He will go down looking on the fastball. So the Marlins leave two runners on the corners, but they still have the lead. Bottom two, Mitch Hanniger hits it into left center. Bader tracking it, and he will make the play. The master Bader comes down with the grab. What a play by Harrison Bader for the first out of the inning. Bader has been utterly dreadful offensively this season, but you know you can always count on his glove in center field as one of the best defensive players in all of baseball. Wow, what a play. Into the third now, Brian De La Cruz leads off the inning for the Marlins. Grounds this one to short. De La Cruz with a great play, and he will throw him out. A very nice throw by Ellie De La Cruz for the first out of the inning. Jazz Chisholm up here. He's going to fly this one into foul territory into left. And this ball will be caught. There's no way that should be called an out. Once the ball hits the net, it should just be a dead ball. It very clearly hit the net because why else would the ball have gone down in that angle? So I don't get that, but they're going to unfortunately call it an out. Rowdy Telez up next. He's got a full count, and he goes down looking on the outside fastball. Other than the leadoff home run that Giolito allowed to start the game, he's been really good today. Bottom three, Vinny Villegas gets the first base runner of the day for San Francisco, and it'll end up being a double. The Giants now the runner in scoring position as they look to put themselves on the board. Jesus Aguilar, the former Marlin, will go down on the two-seam fastball. Nice pitch by Rogers. Ellie De La Cruz singles into right. Runner will look to head home. The throw from Soler is a really good one. But the Agus is just barely safe. An RBI double for Ellie De La Cruz, and this game is tied up. De La Cruz showing off his incredible speed as he makes it to second. De La Cruz is really fast, but he's also really big. He's like six foot four, well over 200 pounds. He is an athletic specimen. Slater strikes out. Now Thyro Estrada is up. Rogers looking to get out of the inning here for the Marlins, but Thyro Estrada singles it into center. Ellie De La Cruz should be able to score with no problem. And it is now 2-1 to one off the RBI single from Thyro Estrada. So the Giants now take the lead as we go into the fourth. Lucas Giolito still pitching really well since that first at bat. He'll strike out Jesus Sanchez once again, this time on the 12-6 curve. Bottom four, Mitch Hanniger leads it off for the Giants. This one hit well into right at the track at the wall. It goes off the wall. Hanniger on his high horse. He's going to look to head for third. Bader's throw is well short, and Mitch Hanniger will start the bottom of the fourth with a triple. MJ Melendez will then hit a rocket into right field, and this one is not coming back. A two-run blast for the young catcher, MJ Melendez, and the San Francisco Giants now lead it 4-1. to one. Trevor Rogers looks so good early in this game, and now he's completely falling apart. He'll be immediately taken out and replaced by Reynaldo Lopez, he started the season off slow, but has played better since. His first batter is Jock Peterson. He hits this one high and deep in his center at the track at the wall. It is gone. Back-to-back -back home runs for Melendez and Peterson, and the Giants lead it 5-1. to one. Jock Peterson with his 17th of the year. Vinny Viegas then hits this one into right. That'll go for a hit. The Giants' offense just looks on fire right now. This team looks unstoppable at the moment. And they're not going to stop anytime soon. Jesus Aguilar hits this into the right center gap. That should be able to score a run, and it's now 6-1. to one. Maybe it wasn't a Trevor Rogers issue, and more so the fact that the Giants' offense looks like the murderers row New York Yankees. Thyro Estrada hits it into center. Bader cannot make the diving play, and it's now 7-1. Estrada drives in his second run of the ball game. The Giants have put up a five spot here in the fourth inning, and they're still not done. Murakami hits it to the wall, and it's caught by Soler. A phenomenal play by Jorge Soler, but not before the Giants score five. They lead this game big. Gilito continuing to impress as he strikes out Harrison Bader. Now facing off against Luis Arise, who homered back in the first inning. Arise hits this one well into left center field, and that one will drop likely for an extra base hit. Arise will make his way to second. The Marlins now the runner in scoring position. This is a really good opportunity to try to put themselves back in the ball game. Brian De La Cruz is up next here for the Marlins. 2-2 two -two count, two away, runner on second. Marlins down big, and De La Cruz checks his swing on the outside fastball. It looked like the pitch was going to be in the strike zone, so he was going to swing. Then it goes towards the outside. De La Cruz is able to check his swing, but not check it well enough. 
A.J. Puck is now in for the Marlins as he strikes out Mitch Hanniger. Puck has got himself a tough duty to ask for here with how good the Giants' offense has been, but Puck looks phenomenal as he strikes out Melendez. Into the sixth now, Jacob Junis is in for the Giants. He has been really bad this year, 6.46 ERA. A great opportunity for the Marlins to look to capitalize. They won't do it in this inning. Junis retires the side with a Nick Fortes strikeout, and it remains 7-1. Puck still in the game here for the Marlins as he gets Austin Slater to go down looking. Two very strong innings from A.J. Puck. However, the Marlins still trail big. Into the seventh now, Jesus Sanchez gets this ball to drop into left. That'll go for a hit. So with nobody out, the Marlins have a base runner here. We'll see if they can do anything with it. Jorge Soler is up next, and Soler will swing and miss at the slider. That one was right down the middle. He wanted to crank that. Bottom seven now, Jonathan Loizaga in through the Marlins. He's really struggled as of late, but he will retire the side with ease as Hanniger goes down on the slurve. The Giants' offense has done nothing since the fourth inning, yet the Marlins still trail big. Jazz Chisholm hits this one well into left center. That one will one-hop off the wall. Chisholm will have himself an easy double. He probably would have been safe to third in hindsight, but with two away, it just would not make sense to send him. So Chisholm's now in scoring position. Rowdy Telez had as a hitter's friendly count, and he'll draw a walk. So now there's two aboard. Big opportunity here for the catcher, Nick Fortes, to try to get the Marlins back in the game. He's got a 1-2 count. Fortes grounds it up the middle, and De La Cruz makes an incredible play. Ellie De La Cruz saves a run from being scored as it remains a 7-1 ball game. Let's go to the top of the ninth now. The final hope is Gene Segura. He got the day off, but is making an appearance off the bench. Flies this one into center, and it is caught. The San Francisco Giants win this game 7-1. A rough outing here for the Marlins. They had the leadoff homer by Luis Arise on the first at bat of the game, and then after that, the offense completely laid an egg. The Giants did not hit the ball overly well. It's just that they had one really impressive hot streak where they scored seven runs within two innings. Trevor Rogers started off great, but he struggled. Lopez struggled. The other relievers were pretty good, though, but the Giants just caught fire, and that's all they needed to win this game big. Their pitching was phenomenal as well. So we're going to simulate the next three games, final game against the Giants and then two against the Dodgers. We would be presented with an intriguing trade here from the Orioles. Braxton Garrett for Joseph Ortiz is a 25-year-old B potential shortstop. I decided to say no, but I did think about it a little bit. Ortiz does look like a pretty good prospect. We ended up going 1-2 and two in the games that I simmed. We got swept by the Giants. That's not good. And then we split the first two against the Dodgers. So that brings us to draft day, and it's time to preview this year's MLB draft. We're going to go over some guys who we've already talked about, and we're also going to go over some guys who we have not talked about yet. The first group of players we're going to go over are the top projected picks. Chances are these guys will not fall in Miami's top selection at number 11 overall, but if they do, the Marlins might want to consider them. We'll start with, in my opinion, the best prospect in this draft, Mariano Rosas. He's a 23-year-old pitcher from Panama, last played at East Carolina University. The reason why I think Rosas is the best player in the class is because of his combination of floor and ceiling. This is a guy who could step into an MLB rotation tomorrow and look competent. Despite that, he's got very high upside as well. This is probably going to be a high-end number two starter. Maybe eventually he'll become an ace. He really checks off all the boxes that you look for in a pitcher. He doesn't necessarily throw the hardest or have the craziest breaking ball, but he strikes out a lot of batters. He wins with finesse. He doesn't allow too many walks. Good control. He's just super steady and consistent, and that's why I think he'll be a top pick. We've got this next group of guys with players like Giovanni Baker, Carlos Guerrero, Earl Berman, and Christopher Aldridge. Of this group, I think Berman is the best prospect here out of Baylor. Berman is probably going to be a top five pick as well. He's a 21-year-old, four-year sophomore who has drastically improved throughout his collegiate career with the Baylor Baylors. He's currently projected to be the number two pick in this draft. While our scouts don't see him as a top two player, our scouts do really like this player a lot and he's going to be a good pro without a doubt. Berman is 21 years old. He's two years younger than Mariano Rosas. Maybe he doesn't have the floor that Rosas does, but he does have more room to grow. Good strikeouts per nine, good walks per nine. He does allow too many hard hits, but other than that, he's really good. 
You've got a few guys in here who are projected highly as position players who kind of look like busts, but I still want to talk about one here with Josh Serrano. He's a Dominican-born outfielder currently playing for Arizona State. Serrano is projected to be the number one pick in the draft to the Washington Nationals. I don't think the Nationals are going to take him, though, unless they absolutely love him as a prospect because they just drafted Justin Kramer last year, and the one position group they're good in is the outfield. I think the reason why scouts do believe that Serrano might be the best player in the draft is his physical tools, but I don't really see it. Other than his speed and his glove, I have a lot of questions about his game. Decent contact, decent plate skills, but he lacks power. He also lacks arm strength. So yeah, he's got the range and glove to play center field, but other than that, there's nothing I really love about him. Let's now go over some guys who I think the Marlins will consider with their first round pick at number 11, assuming all the top prospects don't fall. We'll start with Reggie Weller. He's an 18-year-old left-handed starting pitcher from New York. We have not talked about Weller yet. His stock has skyrocketed over these past few months. We got to see him at the Under Armour All-American game in Chicago, and he was really impressive. Six foot four, 230 pounds. This guy will blow heat right by you. Nasty swing and miss stuff. I think that's really where his upside comes. The walks per nine is a little bit of a problem, though. I want to see him develop that control. And if the Marlins don't pick him at 11, it probably is because of their concern with his lack of command of the strike zone. Carmen A. Casto is a very talented catcher from the Dominican Republic. Now, the Marlins do not need catcher at all. They've got Nick Fortes, who's probably going to be an all-star this year. They've got Joe Mack in the farm system. They drafted Joel Beltran with their competitive balance first-round pick last year. However, I don't believe in drafting for need. I believe in drafting for value. And if Carmen A. Casto is the best player on the board at 11, the Marlins are going to have a hard time not picking him. He's a really, really good contact hitter. It's hard to find catchers with his approach and smooth stroke at the plate. His power is a work in progress, but I think there's something there. And I like him defensively. Good glove, good arm. I think he'll be able to stick at catcher. Augustine De La Cruz is a player we talked about very early in the process. Our scouts have continued to scout him, and they think that this kid is a total stud. He's currently playing in Ohio. He is originally from the Dominican Republic, though, and he moved to Ohio as part of a foreign exchange program. De La Cruz is the best offensive prospect in this draft, and it's not particularly close. He's got ridiculous contact, ridiculous power, phenomenal plate skills. This is a guy who, if he can reach his ceiling, will be the best offensive player in baseball. I know that sounds lofty, but I think he's that good. The problem with De La Cruz is that he provides nothing defensively. I think he's going to be a long-term designated hitter in the major leagues. I feel like it would be pretty irresponsible for the Marlins to draft him because they picked a pretty similar player last year in Woody Landry. But if he falls to the 11th pick, the Marlins are going to have a hard time passing on Big Gus here. His offense might just be too good for them to say no to. I mean, look at those future attributes potentially if he reaches his ceiling. He could be a superstar. If the Marlins do pass on him, or if he's off the board, I think Ronald Landino, the Puerto Rican shortstop, is definitely in play. He is not a very good offensive prospect, and his bat in the future may never be as good as Gus De La Cruz's is right now. So while you're not getting someone who's going to hit 30 home runs and hit 320 every year, I still think there's a lot to like with Andino. Defensively, he is probably the best prospect in that area in this entire class. He can play every position on the diamond. He's got an elite glove. He's got a phenomenal arm. This is somebody who I think is going to win multiple gold gloves in his big league career, and I think he will be able to stick it short. I think he's certainly fast enough and has enough range to be able to handle that position. He's a polar opposite to De La Cruz in the sense that De La Cruz is all offense and no defense, whereas right now Andino's all defense, all speed, but he's got a long ways to go at the plate. It is also worth noting that he opted out of his physical exam. Maybe that scares off the Marlins with the 11th pick if they don't want to pass on somebody who's got a mystery when it comes to his health. Miami has really prioritized offense with their position players in this rebuild, so drafting a defensive maestro might not be the worst idea. I think the other option for Miami's top pick would be Luis Trevino, the switch hitting outfielder who plays his high school ball in Pennsylvania. I think Trevino is the most well-rounded player that the Marlins would be looking at with their top selection. He's a switch hitter who really lacks weakness in his game. He's very good from both sides of the plate, pretty good contact, pretty good power, 
pretty good play skills. He's a solid defensive player, although I don't think he's got the glove or the range to stick in center, so he might be more of a left fielder long term. I think his well-roundedness might be hard for the Marlins to pass up, and that could give him the edge over a guy like Ronald Landino, who is much better defensively, but he does lack some of the offensive intangibles that Luis Trevino brings to the table. So of these five guys we just talked about, I think one of them will be the pick at 11. Reggie Weller, the lefty starting pitcher. Carmen A. Casto, the catcher. Gus De La Cruz at third base. Ronald Landino, the versatile shortstop. And then Luis Trevino in the outfield. I don't think you can go wrong with any of these five players. And I think the Marlins would be very happy to draft any of them with their top pick. But the draft is not just one round. We've got to look at Miami's other selections as well, and that starts in the second round. This is a really deep draft, particularly with the starting pitching, and I could see the Marlins doubling down on pitchers in round two with both of their second round picks. One of the guys I think Miami's going to be really high on is Rodney Dunbar. He's an 18-year-old lefty from New York. His best attribute is walks per nine. That's a big deal for me. I really care about walks per nine. The one thing with Dunbar is I don't think he's going to make it to the Marlins' first pick in the second round, number 46 overall. If Miami wants to ensure they get him, they might have to pick him at 11. Is Rodney Dunbar good enough to be the 11th pick? Honestly, I think he could be. I think he's a fantastic player. I think Hitoki Nomo, the lefty from Japan, is a really good backup option. He did opt out of his physical exam, which is a little bit of a concern, but one healthy, he's really good. Again, the walks per nine, his best attribute, which is a big deal. It's always good to add lefties to the rotation. He does allow the long ball a little bit too much, but other than that, I don't see many noticeable red flags with Nomo's game. I do want to see him get a little bit more consistent, but I think he can be a really solid pitcher in the middle of a rotation in due time. And again, it never hurts to add a talented lefty to the rotation. And I think Hitoki Nomo could be a really solid player in the second round who the Marlins could look at if he falls to their top second round selection, which right now I would say it's probably a 50-50 chance. Looking down the board, if both of those players are gone in the second round, the Marlins have good backup options. Rafael Ochoa from Venezuela is a really, really good player as well. Our scouts don't like him as much as the two players we just went over, but I think Ochoa could be just as good a value in the middle of the second round where the Marlins will be picking. He's a very sturdy and reliable righty arm. He's got good control. He does not allow the long ball at all. His hits and walks per nine are his worst two per nine attributes, though, and those are the two I care about the most, so I guess that's not ideal. And then you've got Esteban Espinoza, who currently is playing in Ohio. He hails from Venezuela, but he moved up to the States when he was 13 years old to pursue his baseball career. And over the last five years, he has risen up the ranks very quickly. He performed really well in the Under Armour All-American game, and his stock is quickly rising. I think if the Marlins want to get him, they would have to choose him with their first, second rounder. But I think he could be really good value. Mike Gonzalez at first base, if he falls, would be a really solid selection. Gonzalez is 21 years old from the Dominican Republic, currently playing at Auburn. I think chances are he will end up being a first rounder. He's just too good offensively, but if he falls to the middle of the second round, it's probably because of his defense and the lack of positional value at first base. But if he does fall, I think the Marlins are going to have a hard time passing on him, even with Woody Landry and Rowdy Telez on the roster. Gonzalez is a switch hitter. He's very good from both sides of the plate. Good contact and good power across the board. And he's not awful defensively. He probably can't really play any other positions, though, but he can manage at first base. Lamar Ash, I think, could be an interesting flyer for the Marlins early in the second round. He's got some work to do, but I like his tools. He's a pretty good contact hitter, especially against left-handed pitching. And for an 18-year-old, he has very good plate skills. Doesn't swing and miss a lot, and he's got a pretty good eye, and I think that goes a long way. He may never hit 30 home runs in a season in his big league career, but I think if he can reach his upside, it can be as somebody who hits at the top of the order, and I think in the second round, he could be a really strong selection. Defensively, I think he's got the range to play center. I do want to see him be a little bit more consistent in the field. His arm is solid but not great, but I do think he can play all three outfield positions, and he's an absolute troll because he wears number 69, so he has my kind of humor, which I guess gives him a little bit of a bonus. He's not the only corner outfielder that I think Miami will look at in the second round. 
As we look at right field, Kyle Brown is a name to watch. This is another guy we talked about very early in the process. He's from Ohio, currently playing in the Dominican Republic. He's participating in the same foreign exchange program that the third baseman, Gus de la Cruz, is in. Kyle Brown is not as good of a prospect as Augustine de la Cruz, but I do think he could be really good, and it would be kind of fun to have these two guys team up. Brown has phenomenal power at the plate. His physical upside is really, really impressive, and I think the ceiling is sky high. His contact needs some work. His plate skills need some work, but he's got ridiculous pop, and he has some things to like defensively. He's got a good glove. He's really fast. I wish his arm was a little bit better, but I think he has the range to play center if needed, along with both of the corner outfield spots as well. If he can improve his contact and his approach at the plate, then he'll be worth a first-round pick. However, there's another outfielder who our scouts like even more, and that's Oroville Morton. He's a high schooler from Oregon. He's a very similar prospect to Lamar Ash, the left fielder we just talked about. The only difference is that he's better. He is very good in terms of his contact. Again, a master against left-handed pitching. Power needs some work, but I think there is some upside. Plate skills are very good. He's got a phenomenal arm, and he's really fast. I think he's got a stronger arm than Lamar Ash, but he's not as good defensively right now. It's a lot easier to develop your glove rather than make your arm stronger. So because of that, I think Oroville Morton is probably a more high upside pick as opposed to the other corner outfielder, Lamar Ash. But again, the draft does not go through just two rounds, and we've got to look at some guys who could go even further down the board. I think in terms of depth in this class after the second round, it's the pitchers who get me intrigued. And we'll start with Carlos Ramirez, an 18-year-old high schooler from Ohio. This is a big kid, 6'4", 230 pounds. He's got really impressive physical skills. And I think a team like the Marlins, who have developed pitchers pretty well recently, would be inclined to take a shot on Ramirez, probably in the third round, and see what they can get with somebody who's got as high of a ceiling as he does. The floor is very low, however, but he strikes out a ton of guys, doesn't allow a lot of hits, but the walks has to improve. I do think his command of the strike zone is pretty good, so I do think his walks per nine very well could get better with time. We get to this next tier of guys with Stephen Elez and Juan Theus Mill. We'll start with Elez, an 18-year-old high school prospect from North Carolina. This is another really big kid, 6'5", 200 pounds. I think he's a little bit more polished than a lot of the high school prospects in this range. And I think his floor, along with his strong ceiling, will certainly tempt the Marlins, again, probably in the third round. Hits per nine, strikeouts per nine, walks per nine, all really good with Elez. Then there's Juan Diaz Mil, who in terms of talent, might be even better than Elez. Look at his potential future attributes. This is a guy who's got a really high ceiling and could be very good. But there's one clear reason why he's not ranked in the top 100 nationally, and it's the medical. He has had lingering elbow problems on his throwing arm. He did not pass his physical exam a couple of weeks ago, causing his stock to slide even more. But the upside might be too much to pass on, probably in the fourth round or later. The Marlins might want to take a shot on the Ismail, but the injury stuff really concerns me, and I think it concerns a lot of other scouts as well. After that, there are more intriguing pitching prospects down the board who, again, are fringe top 100 talents. If you can get that in the fourth round or later, that'd be really good value. I don't think there's as much depth with the position players in this draft class, but there are a few guys I want to talk about. I really like second baseman Cesar Guevara from the Dominican Republic. He's only 18 years old. He's a little bit raw, but I think the ceiling is really good. And in the late second or third round, I'd be inclined to take a shot on a guy like him. Six foot three, 190 pounds. He's a big, firm kid. Good contact, good plate skills. I think with his size, if he can get 20 to 30 more pounds of muscle, he could become a pretty good power hitter in the future. And I think because of that, he could be one of the better offensive second basemen in baseball. He's not phenomenal defensively, but I like his offensive upside. Then you look at some guys down the board who are older prospects who also happen to be raw, but they've also got high ceilings. The one who intrigues me the most, I would say, is shortstop Peter Perez. I think he's the biggest wild card in this entire draft. His potential will probably be an A. If you can get that in the fifth or sixth round, it's hard to say no. But there's a lot of things going against Perez as well. He's played his college ball at Maine. He is really raw 
for being 22 years old. His overall rating will probably start off in the 40s. Maybe if he's lucky, he'll be in the low 50s. Perez also did not pass his physical exam either, and if you look at his future potential ratings, that does not look like somebody who could be a 95 overall. When I scouted him, I thought I recognized him, and it's because he was actually in last year's draft class as well. I opened up an old save file from last year, and lo and behold, there he was at 21 years old, the exact same prospect. He ended up going undrafted and has put himself back in this year's class, but he hasn't really done his stock any favors. And see, here's the other players from last year's class, including Woody Landry. So I think Peter Perez could be a worth a flyer with our sixth round pick just because his potential is so high. But man, I've got so many question marks about him. And he's got a long ways to go for somebody who's 22 years old. I don't know if he can ever reach his ceiling because he's kind of old and kind of bad. So that is the draft class. This is a really fun group of players, and I'm super excited about the draft in the next episode. We've got $10 million of bonus allotment money. We've got the 11th pick in the first round, two picks in the second round, and a real opportunity to improve our farm system. We hit a grand slam with our first draft of not only how good Woody Landry has been, but also getting guys like Robbie Jones, Jubel Beltron, and Cameron Norman. Hopefully this second draft can be just as good. That'll be in the next episode, and it will premiere live on the channel this Sunday. I hope you guys are excited for that. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new, and let me know who you think we should draft down below in the comments. Peace out.